Tell me about your background. Have you always been Christian? What is it? What's going on? Um, so I was raised in church. Um, mm -hmm. I was raised in a church in Croydon, actually, where I'm from. Um, and I went there for a good sort of 13 years of my life. So I've got a Christian mm -hmm. background. I was baptized at a young age, I think around mm -hmm. 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and then long story short, we moved out of that area. Um, and I moved away from that church and I sort of started to drift away from my faith. Mm -hmm. um and from the age of about 17 i had a period of about five six years where i was what you sort of atheist slash agnostic i was just living for myself mm -hmm. i didn't really have mm -hmm. um a moral framework that was based on religion and then when was it probably about seven eight months ago mm -hmm. um i felt convicted to go back to church um mm -hmm. i just remembered that you know there is a spiritual side to this world and Mm -hmm. um, I just remembered about experiences that I'd had in the church growing up. And I do feel that the Holy Spirit convicted me um, to go back to church and, uh, you know, to get back on the right side of things. So um, I've been going strong for about seven, eight months now back in the slave. So you, you've become a convicted Christian, now convicted, I'm convicted felon, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so you become yeah, a good type of, of a convicted person, right? Yeah. Okay, so... Yeah. Wouldn't you say that a big part of why you, you kind of uh, de went towards the, the side of Christianity is because that you grew up with Christianity? Because you say, look, when you say, for example, there's a spiritual side of thing, I completely agree with you, and every Muslim would agree with you. But we would yeah. claim that that spiritual type of thing is not in Christianity. It's not what Christianity teaches. And, and like any, anyone who's follower of any type of religion can have the same kind of idea, right? Can say, like, yeah. there's a spiritual side towards my religion. So spirituality or the idea of the existence of a creator or the idea that, that there's something after death and all of that, something that religion shares, but not necessarily yeah. Christianity. So what makes Christianity true then? Why are you, uh, and, and outside of personal experience, I'm, I'm like kind of <laughs> starting with that, you know, because <laughs> yeah, I know Christians, yeah. they like to speak about personal experience. So outside yeah. of personal experience, mm -hmm. outside of what happened to you in your life and all of this stuff, mm -hmm. what makes Christianity objectively true? Like, okay, invite me to Christianity now. When you see me here, I'm looking for the truth, you know? I believe, yeah, like, Islam course. is the truth, of course, after my research yeah. of Christianity, too. But, mm -hmm. you know, you can show me then maybe something I've messed up, not seen, that you're going to enlighten me to. That an evidence sure. that makes Christianity true, uh, why we're supposed to follow that religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good point that you raised that anecdotal evidence can't convict people of the truth. There has to be something objective. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd say is... It all comes down to Jesus. Um, mm -hmm. It all comes down to um, his life, his doctrines, um, his ontology, who he was, who he said he was. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes down to the historicity of the Gospels as well. So when you read the New Testament and you read the Old Testament, um, they all sort of they all feed into Christianity. So we have the Old Testament, we have um, the fall. Um, we have uh, Christ prophesied and appearing throughout the Old Testament and the Messianic prophecies, um, and then they become fulfilled in the New Testament. We have Christ um, dying Before, for our sins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, because what you're saying is not evidences, like, in a way. You're just saying, yeah. I'm looking for really what type of evidences. Like, when you said, like, the anecdotal experience is not evidence, I'm, I'm seeing uh, that you're not going to be Christian for long. I hope so, right? Because like <laughs> Christians don't see that point. If, if the Christians that remain Christians are usually the ones who are convinced I've had this experience, therefore I'm going to remain Christian no, no matter what you tell me. Those are the ones who remain Christian for a period of time. But you seem yeah. like a rational individual. Like, so my analysis, yeah. you're not going to be Christian for long. But look, when you say, when you say, for example, that the, the prophecies in the Old Testament, when you say evidence, mm -hmm. do you mean that these prophecies are evidence? Let's, let's try, that's why I'm trying to look at this at, at a logical standpoint. What are the mm -hmm. points that you have? The point you have is like there is prophecies and these mm -hmm. prophecies have been fulfilled in the New Testament. Therefore, Christianity is true. Is that your claim? What is your claim? Uh, that will be one of them. Um, I think that's that's the first claim, the messianic prophecy. So let's, prophecy. let's start with that claim then. Sure. Okay. Wh where is the, 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 these prophecies that mention Jesus explicitly and then we see their fulfillment exactly as, this, exactly as the prophecy has been told? Give me an example. So I can't find you one that's explicit that says the name Jesus, because if you have a prophecy that says a man named Jesus will do A, B and C, you'll have every Hebrew child being called Jesus. So he's not named in the Old Testament. 
Um, you're familiar with Isaiah 53. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can I can get it up. I can get my Bible and I can read some some passages from it if you'd like. No, no. Before um, you do that, let me ask you a question now. Yeah. And and I don't do this usually, but le- let's mm-hmm. do this like a thought experiment. I don't sure. I don't believe the Bible justifies Islam. I don't use the Bible to justify Islam. Okay. But uh, yeah. but I can I can now ask you a question now. Let's see consistency. You say there's mm-hmm. a prophecy in the Old Testament about Jesus. I hypothetically mm-hmm. speak. There's a prophecy about Jesus, and for the sake of argument, you're going to agree. This prophecy does not mention his name, but mentions his description or some of his descriptions. Correct? Yes. That's the case, yes. right? With that, you would claim with Isaiah 53. Now, if we, if we were to present another prophecy that does the same thing with Prophet Muhammad, would you then accept that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God? Um, I'd need to see it, and uh-huh. it, would, it would take a little bit more ratification. Why? Um, but because... Same criteria. It is the same criterion. However, um, Jesus fulfills the Old Testament law and he subscribes to who we know God is from the Old Testament. In my opinion, what Muhammad brought um, contradicts our understanding of the Old Testament. No, no, but now now you're adding variables. Now you're adding variables. The the point is this. If the Old Testament itself claims... Mm -hmm. That there will be a new prophet. Not only that, it says he is going to bring a new law because he talked about the law. Right? That same prophecy that I'm going to tell you about is going to even deal with that point. It's going to tell you like that person is going to come for everyone, not just the yes. the, the the Israelites like Jesus came to. No, he's going to say he's going to come for everyone, the whole world, and he says he's going to bring a new Torah, a new law. He's yeah. going to bring a new Torah, right? That that person that I'm talking about is going to bring a new Torah. Mm-hmm. If there's a prophecy, hypothetically, hypothetically speaking, so now applying your logic, if there is a prophecy that says there's a prophet that is going to come. And that prophet that is going to come is going to bring a new Torah, new law. Okay? And, and his yes. description it fits the description of Prophet Muhammad. No one else in history fits the description. It fits mm-hmm. exactly the, the description of the Prophet Muhammad. Would you then accept the Prophet Muhammad as a messenger based on the same criteria? You see, I'm talking about consistency. That's why I asked that question. Based on of the course. same criteria that you've used for Jesus, for I would say a less of an obvious prophecy compared to yeah. what I can show. Mm-hmm. Would you then accept that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger? And I'll give one. There's many examples, but I'm, j- I'm just mentioning one example, for example. is multiple prophecies as well. Just like you can use multiple pro- prophecies, or not really multiple pro- prophecies clear for Jesus, but assuming you can use multiple prophecies in general, I can use multiple prophecies for Prophet Muhammad. And if they're co- why are you not following the cons- consistent standpoint? Look, Jesus never spoke, talking about the idea of God. Jesus never explicitly mentioned the Trinity. He never explicitly said that there are three in one and all of this stuff. He never said that. In the Old yeah. Testament, left and right, you're not going to find anything except that there is God, God is one. Deuteronomy 6.4. Here, here, Israel, Lord God is one God. This is what you're going to find in the Old Testament. This is the same thing yeah. that Jesus repeated in the New Testament. Okay? Yeah. So the idea, yeah. the concept of God is the same concept of God that Prophet Muhammad ﷺ came with. There is only one God worthy of worship. It's the same thing that Jesus has said. It's the same thing that every messenger has said. In fact, if you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament taught mm. that you need to follow laws. Prophet yes. Muhammad came and he taught you need to follow laws. So it fits exactly with the Old Testament. So if there's an Old Testament prophecy that talks about Prophet Muhammad, it fits more than people who would tell you don't follow laws. It would even fit more than that. So I would even use that against you. It's not a point for you, it's a point against you because the Prophet fits the Old Testament more than the idea that you're following with Jesus, which is a Paul idea, it fits mm-hmm. the Old Testament, okay? So I'm saying now, being consistent, would you then accept that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God or no? It's a, simple, it's a very simple uh, formula, I would say. Uh, no, is the answer. <laughs> okay, go ahead. why not? Tell me, give me the logical reasoning. Because you raise a good point. You bring up my criterion of prophecy, but mm-hmm. for for being a messenger of Yahweh, there are criteria, plural. One of the criterion is, well, let me say, not all prophets were prophesied about, um, but to be a messenger of Yahweh, you have to you have to know who God is and you have to um, you have to espouse correctly about his identity. So when you say that Muhammad is more in line with the Old Testament God or the God that we worship, I'd have to disagree because um, the Quran says that that um, Allah is not Before, a father. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, OK, so th- this your point is. Is you disagree yeah. because the concept of God is different with Prophet Muhammad, right? It's the simple point yeah. that I'm trying yeah, to get exactly. to. Okay, yeah. so again, this shows, as I said, inconsistency. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the only thing I wanted to show. 
Because this is the case with, with, with all the Christians that I, that I speak to. I, that's why I don't use the Bible as a criteria anyways, because I don't need it, right? I have my evidences, multiple evidences we can show that Prophet Muhammad as a messenger, objective ones mm -hmm. that Christians mm -hmm. don't have. So I don't need to rely on that. But I just like to show people mm -hmm. the, I, this idea of double standard that Christians would have. They would say, oh, prophecies of that. And whenever we mention, whenever someone would mention a prophecy of Prophet Muhammad in the Old Testament, for example, they will come and say, oh, his name is not there. Where does it say Muhammad, right? Where, where does, yeah. does it say Jesus as well? And then when yeah. you give them a description, they will still not accept. So they would accept Jesus' description. While if you look at the teachings of Christianity today, they are not in line with the teachings of the Old Testament. This is now what we're going to explore because this is your claim. Your claim is that the idea that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ brought of God is not the same idea that, that the people had in the past or whatever it is. And all you're using is the idea of father and they didn't believe father the way you believe in father. So your idea today of God that has mm -hmm. a trinity, go to any Jewish person, they will tell you, you know, your idea now that you have of a father, it does not fit with the Old Testament too. So it's also a different idea, but you still accept Jesus' uh, Jesus prophecies. But you wouldn't mm -hmm. accept Prophet Muhammad's prophecies and you use, again, you see the inconsistency that I'm trying to point out again. So let's talk now about, about this idea of God that you believe in. You believe in yeah. the trinity, I'm assuming. I do, yeah. Okay. Where do you find this idea that you believe in? In the Old or New Testament? Where is it? Uh, so the idea of the Trinity is that God is multipersonal. And it's often, it's a misconception that this idea isn't found in the Old Testament. So in uh, Genesis 19. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop you for, for a second before you read that verse. The, yeah. What is the Trinity again? Just so we can, people can understand. When you say multi, because you can use terms that people might, might not understand. Of course, so the Trinity yeah. is, you correct me if I'm wrong, and then I'll let you read the verse. The Trinity is that there are three persons, mm -hmm. the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The person yes. of the Father is not the person of the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. So they're distinct persons, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But they are one being, one entity yes. in the end. And they're yes. co-equal, co-eternal. Yes. So what the Father has, the Son has, what the Son has, the Holy Spirit has. They're, they're co-equal, meaning they have equality in their attributes. And they're co-eternal means that they all have eternality. They don't have a starting point, etc. Yes. Is that, am I correctly given your belief right now? Man, you gave a better explanation than I could, man. Okay, no problem. Okay, I'll do, I'll do the work yeah. for you. Okay, so yeah, now yeah. If, we, if we look now at the Old Testament, because I understand mm -hmm. what the Trinity is from the councils, which a lot of people don't know. They, they don't yeah. read the councils. They don't even know where their belief is coming from. But I know where yeah, it's coming yeah. from. That's yeah. why I'm explaining it. Look, right. so now you would have to show in the Old Testament where, mm -hmm. it, where it claims that there are distinct persons and there's a distinction between the person and the being. There are three distinct persons that make up one being. Yes. Pay, pay very close attention because this is what the Trinity is. And also you would have to show that these three beings are God and they're all co-equal, co-eternal. Meaning that no one of them is more powerful than the other. No one of them is this and that. You have to show the Trinity. You don't have to show a verse that says that. You can show multiple verses, but you would have to show mm -hmm. the idea is that there is a yeah. distinction between the person and the being, number one. Number mm -hmm. two is that th these three persons are what mm -hmm. makes up the God, i.e. the yeah. Trinity. And mm -hmm. that Trinity is God. And these three persons are co-equal, co -equal. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I would love to see that, you know? <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'm, I'm going to try my best. I'm maybe okay. not the best apologist, but I'll give it a go. Uh -huh. So uh, in Genesis 18 and 19, so this is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So this is where um, <laughs> these people in this city are living very sinful lives. Mm -hmm. You know, you obviously know the story. I know, yeah. They're, li they're living contrary to God's design. And mm -hmm. God judges this, these people because they're all mm -hmm. evil. He destroys the mm -hmm. city. He brings mm -hmm. out the righteous people. Mm -hmm. The key part of this verse is where all these two chapters. Mm -hmm. um, is, so I'll start with chapter 18, verse mm -hmm. 1. Mm -hmm. And the Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground. And said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. So just to lay the groundwork, so the Lord appears to Abraham, but we hear that three men approach Abraham. Abraham, you know, lays down on the ground, um, acknowledges, you know, the majesty that's before him and basically takes care of the three men that are before him. So this is the key point. Um, in the next chapter, one of these men leave and stands outside the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. So this is the next chapter, chapter 19, verse 24. Um, it says, Then the Lord 
rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. So you've got the Lord who visited with Abraham, who's on two feet and he's walking. He's outside the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says here he commands fire and brimstone from Yahweh out of heaven. So you've got the Lord on earth on two feet and you've got the Lord in heaven. And they're, they're both um, they're both destroying the city effectively. So it's not three persons, but it is showing that God can be multi-personal, that he can still be in heaven and have his majesty and he can still be on earth. What you've done right now is perfect because I know the verse before you read it, by the way. But I'm, I'm letting you read it and explain it. So when you yeah. give your own explanation, then you can understand the problematic explanation that you're given. When you yeah. say, uh, first, there is a, a Lord that rained down from the Lord, the other Lord in heaven, that just show, shows two distinct uh, people. Nowhere in yes. that verse does it say they're one. Nowhere in that verse does it say they're persons. And there's a distinction between the person and the being. Only, only what you can really pr prove using that verse, if we, if we were to take it literally, is that there are two gods. And, and yep. one God was doing one thing in, in work with another God. That's all mm -hmm. that you can prove. But the problem is this, is that when Christians read the Old Testament, they don't understand the Old Testament language. And that's why they fall into these uh, contradictions. Because they don't understand the, the language that is used in the Old Testament, the terms that are used in the Old Testament. And, and they read their own kind of beliefs into the scripture, which, which is what I would believe you've done here because you've, you already believe in the Trinity. You looked at this verse and then you thought there's like already, okay, this is evidence for two, but it's not. And, and the reason is very simple. Whenever the term the Lord is used in the Old Testament, it is used either for God himself or for someone who represents God. And that is used everywhere in the Old Testament, not just in one or two places. The word God or the Lord is used all over the place for human beings. It's used for angels. It's used for other entities other than God. For example, it's even used for Moses. If you go, for example, to, I'll give you one example. If you go, for example, to mm -hmm. the Deuteronomy, chapter 33, yep. verse 2. It says the Lord came from Sinai. It's referring to Moses. It's not referring to the, the creator God himself coming with the, with the army of 40. It's talking about Moses. When it says, for example, in, the, in, in uh, Psalms 82, verse 6, mm -hmm. it says that you are God. God is talking to the judges that you, you are God. So you are the representative of God. The term God and Lord is used all over the Old Testament. When it's used, for example, for, for the battle between Jacob and this and that, you got the, the, the Jews believing this is an angel. Even though mm -hmm. the verse is saying the Lord was wrestling with Jacob and the Lord says this and the Lord said that, they say this is an angel. And the reason they say this is an angel is because they say our language in the Old Testament, the word God and the word Lord and all of these words are used for either God himself, Almighty, or his representative. In the case of the story that you have, these are angels. The three entities are not three gods. So they're not three gods other than other God who was on the top of the phone. So now you have four now. So the three that came that Abraham took care of were angels. One of them who was doing that work that you said uh, turned the, the city upside down, that was one of the angels. And we use the term the Lord is referring to him as a representative of God. He was doing that work as a representation of what God commanded him to do. So the one who sent the stones up from heaven is God himself, the, let, the only God, the only creator. And the other one is a representative of the Lord, i.e. an angel. And the evidences I gave you, many evidences, look at all, all over the Old Testament, you'll see that this idea of the Lord or this idea of God is used for any, everyone. Anyone and everyone is used for angels, is used for judges, is used for Moses, is used for whoever you have to see, right? Just like what God says, says to Moses again, I will make you Elohim to the Pharaoh, I'll make you God to the Pharaoh. God, this yeah. idea of God and Lord and Elohim and, and Adonai and all of these terms is used in the Old Testament for God and his representative. In this case, were the angels that came uh, to Lot or A and Abraham met and Lot, both of them met. So th those angels that came to Lot, they were called the Lord because they are the representative sent from the Lord. Now, yeah. and you can, this is not my only explanation. You go read any, any rabbinical t literature. Read, read, read the Talmud, it says read. Read what the, the rabbinical ex, uh, explanations are. They will say the same thing to you. They will tell you that this here is a representative of the Lord and they will give you cross-referencing other verses like, just like I did, showing you that this idea, the Lord or God is used for anyone. Mm -hmm. You see now the problem is whether you take this literally, whether you yeah. first, you have to ignore the context of the Old Testament days everywhere to impose your belief as a Christian because that's not how they read the, the scripture. That's not how the scripture works if you cross-reference it to the other verses. So you'd have to ignore all of that. And even if you did ignore all of that, you still end up with a problem because nowhere there does it say there are three. 
Nowhere there that it says there's a difference between the person and the bee. And nowhere there does it say these two are one. So, so the, the Trinity, that's why I explained the Trinity, right? I was, very, yeah. I was making sure I explained the Trinity because I said you'd have to show me that in the scripture. So far, you've not shown any of the points. First, that there are differences between person and being. That there are three persons that are one being and that these three persons are co-equal, co-eternal. This is what the Trinity is. This verse does not, does not display any of these points. I've shown you two persons. So you've got a person in heaven and a person on the ground who, have the, same, who have the same name. That's the key distinction. They have the same name. So where's the name? The point, the Lord. So, so you, would, so then Moses is also a part of the Trinity because in, as I give you an example, and when it says, yeah. I'll make you him to the Pharaoh and another example in the term 33 verse two. So he has another God. And then all of the judges of the Jews are also a part of the Trinity because Psalms 82 yeah. uses the, the term God for them. And that angel that was wrestling with, with, the, with, the, with the Jacob is also another God. So now how many gods do we have? Because just it uses the same name. So if, you're, yeah. if your argument is uses the same name, this same name is used all over the Old Testament. I can give you more examples. I'm just giving you a few. Sorry. I can give you more and more and more. This idea that the Lord is used all over the Old Testament. Yeah. We have to break them down on a case-by-case -case basis. So where, where the judges are called gods, it's, mm. it's gods, you know, small g. You know, it's, no, not, it's, okay. it's, not, it's not Yahweh. Do you know it. what language is it written in, in the Old Testament? Hebrew. Do you know in Hebrew there's no small and capital? So what is there a distinction when the judges it is the are exact gods? Is the ex it, is it exact same word that is used for all mighty God. Right. Okay. So when it, when it says in Genesis, I'll give you an example. It says in Genesis 1, 1, Bereshit bara Elohim it has vert ha'aretz ha'aretz. In the beginning, Bereshit means in the beginning. Bara is the verb to create, which is in singular form, which shows that God is one. Mm -hmm. Elohim, God, it has shamayin vert ha'aretz ha'aretz. He created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the Hebrew yep. Genesis 1, 1. Okay, mm -hmm. now there is no capital and small there. There's just the word Elohim. Now this right. same exact word, who created the heavens and there? Almighty God, right? There's no, no other yeah. gods, huh? no small g, capital G, Almighty God. The same word there used, Elohim, is the same word used in uh, Psalms 82 verse 6. Open it right now. It exactly yeah. uses the same word, Elohim. No, when it uses it for Moses, it uses the same yeah. exact word. I will make you Elohim to the Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. So it's the same exact word as you said. There's no capital and small, by the way. In the, this is a game that they played in the translations, <laughs> the English translations, right? Because, why did they play this game in the English translations? Because they have a problem. They have all of these references that uses the term God and, and they, do, they want to make a distinction for the reader's mind that, look, these are not the true gods. So, we'll, so make it small g. So they don't think that this is true God. But this is the language of the Old Testament. Is that that term yes. can be used for God himself or people who represent God. So I think we agree there that the word Elohim, depending on how it's used, it's, it's, it's context. It's all in the context. So Elohim just means uh, gods or, or deities. It doesn't mean almighty God. Just because you call someone Elohim doesn't mean they're, they're Yahweh. You know what I mean? Because judges yeah. can't be Yahweh. Yes, so, so Elohim, Elohim is a term. Yes, yeah. so Elohim, no, no, Elohim is a term for God. But, but, uh, yes. but when it's used, sometimes it's used for the representative of God, is what I'm trying to say. As someone yes. who is representing God in that case. So the judges, judges are representing God by fulfilling his laws. Moses is representing God because he's messenger going to Pharaoh. He's going to, as a messenger to him. So when these terms are used, they're used for representatives of God or God himself. Mm -hmm. So it's God or those who represent God. So the, because look, if I send you as my messenger, you are a representation of me. It's as if I'm there. If I say go as my messenger, I'm the king. And I say go as my messenger, tell them that I'm going to send an army of this and that, or do this and that. When you speak it, it's me speaking. That's why you see the same, the same term used, Elohim, for a representative of God, just like it is used for God himself. Sure. Essentially, there is no argument for that verse, right? <laughs> it's all trying to say, right? Okay, so yeah. I'm, I'm happy to hear. Where's the other arguments that you have that you showed me the Trinity in the Old Testament? Because this is the best that you have, um, and I'm, I'm helping you. This is the best that you'd have in the Old Testament. Yeah. Other than that, it's going to be weak, weak arguments. Because the Old Testament um, has nothing that, that shows the Trinity. Let me, let me think. Let me think on that. I do think it's quite a strong verse, but I think it's, you know, obviously... Only if you take it out of context and you ignore every other verse that uses the same term, and you ignore the fact that it does not say there's a difference between person and being. And you ignore the fact that it doesn't say these two are one. You have to ignore all of these things. You have to bring your other belief from other verses in the New Testament. 
or other places yeah. from the church and then impose them on that scripture is what I'm trying to tell you. This is what I want you to understand. And I want a lot of Christians to understand. You cannot read the Old Testament with Christian lens. It's not how it works. You read the scripture as the recipients of the scripture understood the scripture because they know the language better than you. You know, he Hebrew is a sister language of Arabic. We, uh, we understand so, Hebrew a lot more than a lot of Christians would understand. So because oh, there's a I'm lot of similarities right. in the terms and the usages and all of these different things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there, that's why when we read, we understand. That's not necessarily how you understand these verses. And you look, you read, like when you read the Talmud, you read the explanations of the rabbis themselves. You understand, okay, that makes sense. These people are not just saying their opinions. They're giving cross-referencing other verses. And they tell you, look, it's the same word here is used for other than God. Because this, is this person is being a representative of God at this point. Therefore, God uses the same term for him. Okay, well, go ahead, show me other evidences. I'm happy to, to hear. Huh? Where is the um, I'm just having a look through. Um, but I do feel like viewing the Old Testament and the New Testament separately um, is not how we view it, obviously. You know, but, the, you know, our Bible has both. And just to say that, I would say that we let Scripture interpret Scripture. So mm -hmm. if you get Which is what I did. Grand... Yeah, but... You know, the Old Testament was your claim, by the way. You said we should go to the Old Testament, see the God in the Old Testament because of the prophecies. I, I, I'm not the one who went there. You were the one who said that this is the different God, right? So I said, okay, show me the God. You were the one who brought this argument, you know? <laughs> <Not me. laughs> oh, okay. I'm in trouble, man. I'm in trouble. No, no, no. It's okay. Look, look the, honestly, look. this is the thing I was telling you, Johnny, from the beginning. It's not about yeah. scoring points. It's about reaching the of truth. So we're not yeah. trying to make, oh, this is, I, he wins the argument. They want, we, we're trying to reach the truth. I'm giving you, you can see, I'm giving you logical answers. I'm giving you references. I'm giving you reasoning. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm Muslim, therefore, yeah, you have to accept what I'm saying, you know? Mm. That's not it. So uh, I'm exploring with you. I'm happy for any... I, this is what I say to Christians. You know, I just leave, the, leave them the floor always. I say, come yeah. on the chat, okay, present your evidence. And then I'll show you, because I've already done the research. I've already read, read these verses. I've already seen the argument. I'm going to show you why, you why you what you think is evidence is not evidence. This is my job. Nothing, nothing more, nothing less, you know? Yeah. So I think that... With respect, I'm going to struggle to show you three distinct persons in one being in the Old Testament. I'll have to do some more research on it. Mm -hmm. um, should we go somewhere else? Should we, should we go to Isaiah 53, maybe? Oh, if wherever you want to go, look. But Isaiah 53, 53 is not going to work as well. <laughs> but if you can go to Isaiah okay. 53, because look, if okay. you go to Isaiah 53 verse 10 and explain it to me, go ahead. Okay. Isaiah 53 um, verse 10. Can I also include verses four through? seven no no i know what the verses say and if you like to read them you can read them he was bruised for our sins for our iniquities i know exactly what you want to read but i'm yeah. saying right now if we read the scripture you were just saying you have to let the scripture interpret itself this is yeah. what i'd love to do if there's a prophecy about jesus the whole prophecy have to has to fit him you cannot take a part of oh. some of the verses say that they do some verses we say they don't do so yeah. 53 which christians would claim is a suffering servant this is the term they use for it mm -hmm. which the jewish people will tell you is referring to israel because they did suffer children of Israel, they did suffer and they were bruised for iniquities and sin and things that they've done. And they will tell you, look at that, because the term the servant, they will tell you is used. You look at Isaiah 50, 51, 54. They will say to you, look, the verses, the chapters before and after, this is what the rabbis would tell you, right? This is their explanation sure. that I'm giving you right now. They'll say to you, this is referring to Israel. It's not referring to one individual or one being or one, or one entity. And this is what I'm going to show you from that verse that I'm asking you about. So how do you understand that verse 10? Verse 10, uh, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has mm -hmm. put him to grief. When mm -hmm. you shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, mm -hmm. and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Okay, so the term there used for seed is zera, which means offspring children, literal, literal children. Are you still there or? Ah, you're okay. Oh, sorry, I'm back. Sorry, it's almost just called. No, 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 I'm just making sure that it's all good, right? <laughs> He's the interim, maybe. Look, the term yeah. there, zera used there, is used for offspring, children. So it says two things. Yes. The God will prolong mm -hmm. the days of that whoever is being prophesied for here. So he will live yeah. a long life. This is what prolonging days means. And number mm -hmm. two, it says that they will have children. They will see. Mm -hmm. He will see. They will see the children. That entity that is being pro uh, prophesied is going to see its children. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at Jesus, he is the exact opposite of these two things. First, dying at the age of 33, according to what Christians believe. Mm -hmm. Dying at the age of 33. So still in his youth. He's a very young yes. man. Mm -hmm. And then uh, never have married or have seen children in his life. Mm -hmm. So why do then the Jewish people believe it's about the children of Islam? Because it's the same. God is, is promising them that you're gonna, you will continue. You're not going to get extinct because they were small groups. 
They were always scattered. He was always being attacked. So God is mm -hmm. telling them that you, I will prolong your days. You're not, you're not going to be extinct. And I will increase your numbers. You will mm -hmm. see your children. You'll see your Zerah. You'll see your seed. Mm -hmm. So this is a promise that God has given them. Okay, even though you had all of these afflictions, even though you were bruised, even though you were this and this and that, God is promising them as the children of Israel that no, you will have a long life. You will have everlasting days. You have more days to live. And I will increase you in numbers. Yeah. Which is so, why I would say this chapter cannot fit Jesus. Right. Okay. That's fair enough. Um, so how us Christians would read this verse if they do believe it's messianic. Um, <laughs> prolong his days. I mean, you know, what year is it? You know, a whole, like in terms of how we view Jesus and his impact on everything, on our lives, on culture. It doesn't necessarily have to mean your days are prolonged in terms of your life. So you're going to metaphorical like, meaning? Yeah. Because okay, so uh, first, first, first metaphorical yeah. meaning for prolonging days. Now, what about children? Go ahead. Um, well, I've heard different interpretations of this. Um, his seed. I mean, we are sort of children of God in a way. Okay. We are okay. Okay. So as, as children of Christ. Yes, but you're um, the children of the Father. If even if you were to take that interpretation, you're not the children of the Son. But he, he, I'll, look, I'm gonna you know, even explain, accept that. You know, look, I'll be very nice. But in the end, do you see the problem you're having now? When you start interpreting the parts you don't like metaphorically, I can do the same thing with the parts you like. So you can read anything okay, there. Yeah. You that's can right, read anything right. there, and and I yeah. can, as I said already, I've already given you an explanation. I can already tell you this is referring to the children of Israel. I can tell you this and this and that. You can interpret anything metaphorically if you like. Okay, let's try it. Verse okay. 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, mm -hmm. and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. It's already a metaphor, but go ahead. Okay, did Jesus open his mouth? <laughs> or, did, or is he silent? Okay, but you see the problem. Look, the these ver mouth. verses, look. When you read them completely, okay, I can, as I said to you, I can easily say this is referring to the children of Israel. They were bruised, they suffered, they had all of these issues, they were offered the sheep to their oppressors when they were oppressing them and killing them like a lamb led to the slaughter. That's a common term, by the way, right? A lamb led to the slaughter. Like Christians think it's just about Jesus being said. No, it's a common term used. And even from the time of Abraham, it's a common term used when that, that ram was given as a sacrifice. This is just a common term, like a ram, you're bringing a ram to slaughter it. But because Christians, they go to John the Baptist when he said, this is the ram of God. Like, and they bring all of this. Do you see the point? You read in the lenses of the New Testament. That's why these things become, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, this is. But then you, you come with these problematic parts and you ignore them. Like yeah. the idea that he does not open his mouth. The idea that, that he will have children. The idea, okay, you have to reinterpret. You have to change this and that. In reality, none of this is going to convince someone who's rational, who's, who's not biased. That, okay, oh, this is Jesus. I disagree. I, I couldn't disagree more. I think that when people hear this verse, they're shocked because it sounds exactly like Jesus. If we're really honest and we read verses one through eight, if Jesus doesn't pop into your brain, you have a negative bias. I'm not saying it's definitely 100 percent set in stone, but if Jesus doesn't come to mind here. You, no, no, it would come to mind for Christians. Yeah, is the point I'm, I'm trying to make is like you Christian, you already have a belief, so it will come in your mind. Mm -hmm. But if you objectively analyze, I'm saying verse by verse, and you try to fit it to Jesus, or word by word, what exactly what it says, and you try to fit, uh, to, to fit it to Jesus, it's not going to work, is the claim I make. But anyways, I've given you that, that, the answer to that, that verse. What else okay. would you like to give? Um, the last thing, and then I will move on to the next person. <laughs> it was a long, a long okay. discussion, yeah? Well, yes, no go problem, ahead. Man. No problem. And you can ask me, by the way, I will let you, if you want to ask me, you can ask me now even, if you want to ask me something, because you mentioned the Quran before. We wanted to ask something about the Quran because I've been asking you about the Bible, right? So if you like mm -hmm. to ask me this, I like to always give a chance because I don't try to do something where I talk just about your religion. And the, if you like to ask something about Islam, you got any questions? Mm -hmm. I'm happy to answer anything as well. So it's up to you. Okay. Of course. Sure. Um, maybe, maybe I'll just end with, with a psalm that's another messianic prophecy and um, mm -hmm. uh, I'll maybe let someone else sort of cross-examine you, so to speak, on, on the Quran. Um, where am I? So this is Psalm 22. You're probably mm -hmm. familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, where should I start? Uh, so I'll start at verse 14. I'll just read a few verses. So this is Psalm 22 for anyone who's mm -hmm. interested. 
um, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shard and my tongue cleaveth to my, to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. The dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, or my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So again, you've got parting, you know, casting lots for the clothing, parting garments. You've got, you know, the 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 author here, I believe it's King David, um, talking of hands and feet being pierced. That never happened to David. So again, this is another messianic prophecy in the Old Testament about Christ's crucifixion. Do you agree this fits every single person that has been crucified throughout history? Um, let's have a look. The hands and feet being pierced, yes. Okay. Um, but the parting of the garments, no. Is it possible? This, what do you mean by parting of the garment first? So when Christ was being crucified, they uh, tore his clothes and they cast lots. Okay, so, so are you saying it's not possible that there are people who... This happened often, by the way, that people were crucified uh, naked because they, they tore the clothes out from them. In the Roman Empire and in many places. Okay, mm -hmm. this fits any... Look, bring anyone who crucified throughout history. Mm -hmm. And this idea fits them, fits them. Yes, that's true. That's true. A lot of people were crucified, including um, uh, a couple of the apostles, I believe. But crucifixion wasn't known to King David at this time. This is uh, over a thousand years before. So this wasn't the culture where, you know, we're in Jerusalem and it's occupied. How do you um, know that the, the King David did not know about crucifixion? How do you know that his people didn't know about crucifixion? Do you not know that there um, are previous empires that had this, uh, this idea of crucifixion? The Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, there was multiple different empires before mm -hmm. and at that time. That had was, the crucifixion on the cross? Before even. Before. Not necessarily the idea of crucifixion itself, piercing and cutting clothes, this or that. You can find it in history happening mm -hmm. very early mm -hmm. in history. Mm -hmm. Point is, look, th there is nothing there that is like really pinpointing. This is why I say, you know, this is why I say, if, if I were to bring you an example of that prophecy about, that I was telling you about Prophet Muhammad, but I, I'm not going to do that because, as I said, I don't use the Bible as a justification for Islam. But if I were to bring that, there is nothing more clearer that can be done because it's, it doesn't only pinpoint his description, description that mm -hmm. only fits him, but even the pinpoints where he's going to come and what his message is. Okay. So, so this is what I would say is a clear prophecy, pinpointing his lineage, where his lineage is, is going to come to, which people he's going to go to, what is he going to bring, who is he going to, and, and what he will say to these people, and what will happen between him and them. All of these yeah. things are in the prophecies I'm talking about. This oh, is. Man, you're, gonna to, you, you're gonna have to show me now, man. You're teasing me. Man. Okay, if you if you want, I, I'm not. I'm, I don't mind showing. You. Okay, go to Isaiah 42. Go open Isaiah 42. Should I read it for you? Or you can uh, you yeah, have go it? Ahead. I've, Tell I've me if you have it and then I read it, yeah? Because I have yeah, the, the interlinear. Okay, so it okay. says, Behold my silver whom, whom I uphold, in my chosen one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. Justice he will bring forth to the Gentiles. You know who the Gentiles are? Yes, non-Jews. Non-Jews. So did Jesus come? He came specifically for the Jewish people. So this is an individual here coming for the Gentiles, not coming for the, for the Jewish people. Okay. Incorrect. Jesus yeah. Incorrect. Not he will cry out. Hmm? Not he will cry out. He's gonna say, my, he's not gonna say, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? Crying it out. He's not gonna do that. He will not. He will cry out. Nor raise his voice. Nor cause to be heard in the street his voice. This is the verse two, right? Verse three. Mm -hmm. uh, a reed bruised not. He will break. And a flax flax smoking not. He will quench. For truth he will bring forth justice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Verse four. Mm -hmm. Not he will fail nor be discouraged until he established in the earth justice for his Torah, 
in the Hebrew, which is law for his law. There, mm -hmm. the word is Torah, literally. Mm -hmm. So he's going to bring a Torah with him. Mm -hmm. The coastlands shall wait. So the world, everyone is going to wait for his Torah, for his new law that he's going to bring. Jesus did not bring a new law. He said, I did not come to destroy the law or the, or the prophets. He did not come with a new law. He followed the old law. Now, this person here is going to bring a new law for everyone, as this verse is saying. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thus says the Lord Yahweh who created the heavens and stretched the earth. Now he's just talking about God and his characteristics. You can read them. If you've got any questions yeah. about them, you can pinpoint if you like. Ayla, we have, uh, yeah, we have called you, etc. He's just talking about things which are not really uh, important. But then here it says to open the eyes of the blind, mm -hmm. to bring out the prisoners. So, uh, so you will bring people out from darkness. Yeah, you're bringing light, you're bringing people out from darkness. Okay. Sorry, what, what verse are we on? Sorry, I'm lost. Seven. Seven, yeah. Yes. And then eight says, I'm Yahweh, this is my name, and my glory uh, to another I will not give, nor my praise to crave, craved images. So here mm -hmm. the Lord is saying, this idea here, this person is coming is about people who worship idols, they worship images, they worship statues. I'm not going to give them my glory. I don't share my glory with images. I don't share my glory with idols. And this is going to even become more clear when you're reading uh, later on. But here, 42.8 is referring that he's gonna, not going to share his glory with idols and images and statues. Okay. Yep. Now the former things behold have come to pass and new things I declare before this, uh, this, they spring forth. I tell you uh, of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sing to Yahweh a new song. So there's a new thing, a new law here, a new praise, a new song. You know, the Quran is being recited. It has a melodic sense. It's very close to the, the idea of being a new song. Okay. So yep. sing to the Lord a new song and his praise from the ends of the earth. And you, the inhabited, the inhabitants, the people who live, let them lift out their voice uh, in the wilderness, the villages. Let the inhabitants of Kedar sing. You know who Kedar is? Uh, he is uh, Ishmael's son. He's the Arabs. He's one of his sons. Yes. And he is used Ishmael's specifically. Son. He's used specifically for the Arabs. Kedar mm -hmm. and his children are a reference to the Arab, the Arabic people. And you can see where his child is in Genesis twenty-five thirteen. If you want the exact reference, you will see it says Ishmael is sons, and then he's going to mention Kedar. Nabayoth, and then he's going to mention Kedar. So this is a specific reference, even if you want ever. And then it says, let, so it's saying, let these people sing now. Who's going to sing this new song, this new law, these new things that are coming, this new prophecy? It's coming for the people of Kedar. Let the inhabitants, let the Arabs, now we're going to use the right term, let the Arabs yep. sing a new song. Yeah, let them uh, wait for that praise. Let them, all of these things. And then it says, the inhabitants of Selah. And when it says Sela, Sela is a mountain in Saudi Arabia, Medina. Yeah. Specifically, where the mm -hmm. Prophet's mosque is, yeah? Medina, specifically, yep. pinpointing that place. So it's saying that the, the Arabs, and then it's saying specifically a mountain is where it's Saudi Arabia, Medina. And then it says, let them give to Yahweh glory and his praise in the coastlands. So let the people, the Arabs, let them praise the Lord and thank the Lord and all of that. Yeah. And then uh, Yahweh, like a mighty man, shall go forth like a man of war. So now he's talking about someone. Now again, I said the Lord is used for the representative of the Lord. Here he's talking about the representative of the Lord. What he's going to do. He's going to go like a mighty man. He shall go forth. He will be a man of war. He shall stir up zeal. He shall cry out. Okay? Against his enemies, he shall prevail. So he's going to fight against enemies, that specific person. He's going to defeat his enemies too. Okay? That yeah. uh, person who's being prophesied. Mm -hmm. I've been, I've held my peace for a long time. I have been uh, restraining myself uh, like a woman in labor. I will cry out, I will pant, etc. And then it says, I will lay waste the mountains and hills uh, and their vegetation dry up. I will make it the rivers and coastlands and the pools. I will dry up. Okay. Mm -hmm. and then it says, I will bring the blind uh, by a way they did not know. In path they did not know. I will lead them. I will make darkness before them light and crooked their places straight. So this is all what is going to happen to these people. They're going to be awakened. They're going to have light. The Arabs, yeah? These people are going to like have light. They're going to be taken away from darkness into light, which is exactly what the Quran uses for Prophet Muhammad. So he can take them out of darkness into light. Literally, this is what the Quran term uses for Prophet Muhammad. They shall be turned back. They shall greatly be ashamed. So they will lose now against this man of war, right? Like Prophet Muhammad fought against the pagan Arabs. Why did he fight against the pagan Arabs? Because they were worshipping idols. And then, then it says explicitly, they shall be greatly ashamed. They shall greatly be ashamed. Those who trust in graved images, those who say to molded images, you are our gods. So it's not only mentioning the Arabs. 
It's mentioning that person. It's mentioning where, where his lineage, where he's coming from. Where is he going? What his people will do. The fact that they will be defeated. The fact that they worship idols. The fact that he's going to be a man of war. He will fight against them and, he, and they will lose. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. it, all, it mentions, you deaf, hear you not. Look that you may see my servant, my messenger, whom I sent. Now, <laughs> you know, you can read, you can read, look, I, for me, look, I cannot be more clear than this, right? It talks about, look, it talks about, I'm going to pinpoint the point now that this, yeah. this verse mentions. But as I said, I'm not, I don't even need to use the Bible as a justification. I literally do this, I've literally done, done this in the past. But mm -hmm. it says someone is going to come who's going to bring a new law. He's going to be sure. sent to the whole world and, and Gentiles. His message is yes. for the whole world to the Gentiles. It says that that person is going to be for, uh, going to the Arabs, the children of Kedar. It says that they will be taken out of darkness into light. It says that he's going to fight war against them and they will lose because they trust in graven images and God doesn't share, share his glory with graven images. It says that they will sing a new song. It says that they will be uh, pleased because that man defeats his enemy and they will be taken from darkness into light. And that person is going to be a messenger. So don't be blind. Look, God is telling you. Do not be blind. Do not be deaf to that messenger whom I'm going to send to you. Now, this yeah. is what I would call a prophecy. You know? <laughs> you know? This is what yeah. I would call a, a this is what I would call a a clear prophecy for those who are actually interested in clear prophecies. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So this is yeah this is it. You said to me to give it to you so I, to read it to you so I'm just reading it out to you. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. There's there's definitely some um, some challenging stuff in here, especially about the um, the you know uh, descendants of Kedar and things like that. Um, and the mountain Sela and that they worship idols and that. They, that the, he's going to be a man of war, he will stir them up and defeat them. No one in history fits this, this description except Prophet Muhammad. No one came to the Arabs claiming that he's coming for, uh, on behalf of the God of Abraham, doing exactly this, these things except Prophet Muhammad, taking them out of darkness into light, making them praise God in the mountains. Go to Mecca. What do people do in Mecca in pilgrimage? They praise God. When people yeah. go and they say, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, or praise to, to Allah. All mm -hmm. this is what people do in the mountains everywhere now. Mecca and Medina is just a place where you worship, praise God. These mountains that, that are talked there, they're praising God. They speak, they, they recite the Quran there. Mm -hmm. No one fits this like a glove. It's clear, it's kind of, you cannot like escape this idea. No one can come in history and, and do anything because there's no more idol worship in the deserts of Arabia. Yeah. It's, it's been extinct because God has taken that glory as he says in that verse. That I've held for too long. They've been worshiping idols. Now I'm going to take this away. There's no, yeah. not going to be any more worship of idols. Mm -hmm. And it was taken away. Yeah. So that prophecy cannot even be fulfilled in the future. It's, it has to be that this has to be what happened with Prophet Muhammad. If you believe it, if you take it. And what's interesting is one of the companions of the Prophet, he mentioned some parts of this verse as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Like Abdi, my servant. He mentioned the beginning of the verse referring that this was in the Torah that he was reading. Or, or not reading because it wasn't there translated fully. But what he heard from the rabbis, etc. Is that this a prophecy that fits Prophet Muhammad? And that companion mentioned that prophecy, which is very close to, to this. Uh, definitely he was referring to this because it has some of its wording in the hadith, in the narration of that companion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyways, yeah, I'll, I'll then I'll have to let you go. You know, it's been one hour, you know, <laughs> talking. Oh, man, but, come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but do this all night, mate. I, yeah. I would let you, yeah, but there are other, other people in the backstage as well, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You've got a lot of people have their turn. Yes, yes. So what I want you to do is do some research, you know. You've brought your verses. I've shown you the issues with these verses. Do some research. Yes. And uh, yeah, if you need anything, you're going to ask any questions, like you can email me, reach out to me on social media, or try to come on a different day. You're always welcome mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, you know, always welcome, as I said. Okay, I'll let you go now. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. I appreciate the manners and, mm -hmm. and I appreciate being open minded and being rational. I can clearly see the sincerity and open mindedness and rationality. So I said to you, you're not going to be Christian for long. You know, in the beginning of the stream. Because usually it's, it's mostly just personal experience and then people speaking out of emotions, etc. You don't seem that type of individual. And, and I do hope that Allah guides me and you and, and God guides everyone to the truth. I hope, inshallah. Okay? I'll let you go, uh, friend. I'll let you go, Johnny. Okay? It was nice talking to you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, thank you for having me, mate. And uh, no hopefully problem. we'll see you again soon. No problem. My pleasure.